Good morning, good afternoon. I wanna wish everyone joining us today a very warm welcome. We're here to talk today about the exciting world of decentralized trials. And I'm pleased to be joined by some very experienced individuals in this space, experts, leaders, people who are going to um, cause us all as a community to have a very thought provoking conversation today over the course of an hour about the meaning of decentralized clinical trials and bringing a patient-centered approach to the industry that we all are a part of. I do want to make um, an introduction of myself and then go through a few housekeeping items. So I am Michelle Rohr. I am Senior Vice President of Regulatory here at Roche Genentech. And I'm joined by experts who you will be meeting in just a moment. You saw the community guidelines on the screen previously. We do look forward to engaging with you with questions or comments. Per our guidelines, we won't be talking about any products themselves, ongoing clinical trials, our companies. Um, these need to be addressed um, offline. The acronym of DCTs is another item. What is DCTs? Decentralized trials, hybrid trials, trials at home, all of these types of trials are under the acronym of decentralized trials. And so for its simplicity today, we'll be calling this bucket of trials, decentralized trials. We may on occasion use the acronym DCT. We invite you during this conversation to post your comments in the chat. We have moderators who will be posing those uh, questions to us. We will be drawing on these across the session. And now I want to express a warm welcome to all the panelists. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. It's just wonderful to have your experience um, with us in conversation. Um, I'd like to invite each of you to introduce yourself, but also give us a sentence on why decentralized trials? Why is this an important topic to talk about? First up is Yvonne, an amazing patient-centered expert in our world. And then we'll go from there to Jeff, and then Craig, and then Elizabeth. Elizabeth um, has incredible experience with regulators um, talking about a clinical trial. Craig um, has been very vested as a patient advocate, um, but also representing many stakeholders um, through his business. And Jeff was one of the first innovators in the clinical trial space. So we'll go Yvonne, Jeff, Craig, Elizabeth. So over to you, Yvonne, first. Thanks, Michelle. Hello, everyone. I'm Yvonne Ulrich. I'm 28 years in the industry. I'm the current global head of Senior's Health Patient Insight Experience. And prior to that, I was working for Roche and Novartis and, and other companies. And I started as a CRA and project manager, project leader. And I always had a passion for improving the way of working and how we do clinical trials overall. And during my career, I had several leadership roles and then Eight years ago, I had breast cancer, and this changed my perspective how to go through not only clinical trials through life and how we can bring patient perspectives much closer to everyday activities at work in R&D, but also at home. So I was wondering how we can bring this patient-centered mindset closer to work, and I founded the first internal patient organization at Roche, Patients Are Us, and I'm also a strong supporter of uh, a group which is called Yes We Cancer uh, to support patient centricity and centric work. And at Rush, we became, I became a, a patient strategist, as I call it, a visionary to support product teams to bring the patient voice much closer to R&D. And YDCT, I mean, even today, and we work as I said, 28 years I work in this space, we work very hard to make clinical trials more accessible or better uh, for patients to join. But today, 80% of our clinical trials are not recruiting in time and are delayed and have challenges for recruitment. 
So DCT can make a difference and we need to improve the way how we deliver uh, clinical trials. That was my one sentence, which was long. Over <laughs> to you, I think, Jeff. <laughs> I'm or Craig, Dr. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I'm Dr. Jeff Kingsley, and I call myself a recovering physician. Um, almost two decades ago, well, more than two decades ago, I started doing clinical research, but almost two decades ago, I started a research company um, on the site side of the research enterprise, and it was meant to be a hobby. And six months later, I was in love with the clinical research enterprise. And the way you interact with patients, the level of respect with patients, the, the care, the delivery of healthcare alongside of obtaining scientific data that we need. And so I gave up my medical practice nearly two decades ago as a result. That's how I got into clinical research. And to this day, I adore what I do. I love this space. Michelle, your question was why decentralized clinical trials? The hardest thing that we do is put patients in trials. Writing a protocol, doing the statistical analyses, deciding a marketing campaign, everything else that we do is easier than putting patients in trials that meet IE criteria. And so I view decentralized clinical trials as something that is a must, not a nice to have. We have to make research more patient-centric we have to enable patients to do it from their living room or their workplace, push more data acquisition into the patients. It's in the best interest of our industry and it will have a ripple effect everywhere. It will reduce the overall cost of R&D. It will enhance the speed to regulatory approval. That's why I'm in love with DCT. Michelle, it's great to be here. My name is Craig Lips, and I'm certainly grateful to the team from Roche for bringing us all together. This is my first time on LinkedIn Live, and so I'm very excited to engage with this audience and see what kinds of questions come up together. Uh, so I was previously the head of clinical innovation at Pfizer, during which time I had the opportunity some 16 years ago to help design and uh, and help participate in the leadership of the remote trial at Pfizer. That journey for me really represented an aggregation of my experience as a patient at the time, becoming very engaged in the e-patient and participatory medicine movements myself. Um, today, I'm independent. I, I have an advisory practice, but I'm also the co-chair and co-founder of the Decentralized Trials and Research Alliance, DTRA, which is a nonprofit collaboration of some 140 organizations, including Roche and Cineos working together um, to help ease the global adoption of decentralized research. I'm also the vice president of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, which I'll gently mention because it is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month. So why decentralized? Well, for a long time, this was about patient factors like improving access and experience. Over the last few years, this is uh, we've had an increased spotlight on the potential impact for improving diversity, equity, and representation. But perhaps now uh, there, there's an additional factor for why decentralized that we didn't really think so much about in the past, which is one of resilience. When we have so many factors that can conspire to stand in the way of a research participant being able to access a site. It was a pandemic for the last few years, but I don't know what lies ahead. If it's COVID-24, if it's war in Europe, if it's murder hornets, fires, I don't know what stands in the way, but there will be factors that emerge and stand in the way. And I think we've come to appreciate that decentralized research provides us a countermeasure, it provides us the opportunity for resilience and continuity in the face of whatever may stand in the way. And now over to you, Elizabeth. Oops, you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. And so just to give a very brief introduction of myself. So 
My name is Elizabeth Yogaraj. I'm a global regulatory leader in oncology, working on across a number of oncology projects. So my interest in decentralized trials actually came about um, as we were working on a trial for which we wanted to recruit patients in a rare cancer alteration. So just moving on, um, why decentralized trials? So for me, it's really about giving participants the choice. Very often in industry, when we're conducting and designing clinical trials, it's very easy to forget that the participants are not just statistics or data. They are people managing health conditions while running businesses, working full-time jobs and raising families. And so when this is the case, requiring participants to attend site visits, which involve hours of travel and accumulated costs, it's not just difficult, it can actually be quite impossible. So decentralized trial solutions or modernized solutions, however you want to refer to that, actually gives participants the choice. And so essentially they can then decide what aspect of their research activities conducted at home, close to home or at the site. And we shouldn't forget that choice is important because not every participant is the same. And so having that choice and fitting into the circumstances is really important. So when we're talking about patient-centric clinical trials, it's this choice piece for me that's the epitome of patient-focused approach to clinical trial design. Beautifully said. And uh, you covered one of the first topics, Elizabeth, that we wanted to cover, which was a definition. And I think um, to summarize what you said, really decentralized trials can be everything from everything done at home um, and and nurses coming to the home exclusively at home to um, at the trial site, but with certain items done, um, done at the, the patient's home. Um, Craig, you're first up. Are you ready? Fire away, Michelle. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, you know, 20 years ago, um, you designed one of the first um, what we call decentralized trials. I don't necessarily want to talk about that trial in particular, but certainly over the 20 years, there's been an evolution of digital technologies. And when you think back to 20 years ago and what we have available now, what what characteristics of this digital revolution have enabled a new possibility in the world of clinical trial research? Well, Michelle, it is a great point in, in, in your question in that we've had so many tools to enable these approaches in our research toolkit for years. And many researchers have been using tools from the decentralized research toolkit for over a decade. Uh, we talk about processes like visiting nurses and home health. Um, we talk about processes like leveraging central labs and central imaging to enable more local specimen acquisition. But it is a great point in terms of how the digital transformation has only uh, improved uh, and, and improved the number of tools and our confidence in the tools that are available. We think about digital tools today like e-consent and our use of video, our ability to acquire measurements in remote ways, whether through remote monitoring or through modernization and digitization of endpoints. And increasingly, how can we ensure uh, more diverse data acquisition, such as our ability to enable participants to bring electronic health records and real world data into our research. Some 15, 20 years ago, we relied mostly on EPRO, electronic patient reported outcomes or electronic diaries as our primary digital tool for many of these studies. And even back then, before the uh, proliferation of smartphones, these were on pretty rudimentary devices. These were back in the, in the Palm Pilot era of electronic diaries. But the increased uh, number of digital tools in over the last two, three years are increased confidence as consumers, physicians, patients in using many of these tools is only helping to drive our level of comfort and confidence in using them in our research studies. Like many of us, I barely had used video with my own doctor uh, before the pandemic, but now this is becoming increasingly normal. As we'll talk about, I'm sure, over the course of our time together, 
Digital measurements are going to become an important catalyst, for instance, for our ability to create options and choice and how people can engage. Our ability to measure endpoints is, 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 is paramount for why we do research. And if we don't have confidence in our data integrity, agnostic to the location where a patient may be, it's going to make it hard for us to get to that nirvana of giving people a choice that they deserve and how to engage. That's, that's great. I think one of the things that digital tools, you know, like this little thing I'm wearing, um, afford is that for diseases that wax and wane, um, you know, the ability to really see what the patient sees in the data on a day-to-day -day basis is a is really a, a revolution as opposed to going into the clinic. And I had this stomach ache yesterday, but I don't have it today, but it's a, it's a real effect on, on the patient um, and being able to pick up a treatment effect. Um, these kind of symptoms that occur, like we all know at home, but not when you're in the doctor's office all the time are important to pick up and certainly digital helps us. So Yvonne, you're up next, you ready? Um, this is a prompt so that we all get, get ready on our mute, mute button. Um, so uh, Yvonne, in terms of the patient-centered approach, um, certainly there's this idea that remote trials or decentralized trials are more patient-centered. Is that the reality though? Um, aren't there still some patients for whom clinical trials are a bit of a dream? Um, how, how might decentralized trial help us with the whole diversity and inclusion or patient-centered perspective, really? Yeah, thanks, uh, Michelle, for the question. I, I would like to start sharing my own experience as a patient. Because when I just scheduled appointments, when I went through my cancer uh, treatments, I have to take the phone, get in somebody on the line, take several times until I get somebody. Then I get an appointment and take my car, I drive there. Not everyone has a car um, to be able to drive even to the center. But I, I went to the center, had to find a parking spot, very busy, never found really easy access to a parking spot. Then I found one was at my doctor's office and there was a huge delay on because there were emergencies. So I had to wait uh, for my appointment. And having cancer is very stressful and going through all these treatments is very stressful. So I had to plan and, and wait for an hour. And then I got my, not only treatment, my uh, conversation with my doctor, which was a lot of information. I was treated, um, looked at my watch, Lunchtime is over. My kids came home from school. I had to organize the neighbor to pick them up. Um, going home the whole day, more or less involved in all the treatment activities. Being home, don't remember anymore what the doctor said. Uh, even I'm coming from the field, but there's so much information. Um, what does it mean? What do I need to do next? I have radiology, uh, appointments, etc. And I couldn't ask anybody in the evening when new questions came up. There's no, no service to the patient. And with decentralized clinical trials, I'm looking for decentralized healthcare to provide options in particular for patients who have very difficult diseases to manage. It's a full-time job, um, but we have all other things to do in a life. So decentralized Healthcare provides really options. It's a service. Like I would not book a travel with our current healthcare system. And it does, I mean, this was eight years ago and it's not really different today. A lot of burden to, for patients to manage their disease, to go through the appointments uh, and integrate it in their lives and get the support they want. I wished for certain, you know, appointments. I could do that from home. I wished I would have telemedicine, um, accessing, you know, my doctor via video calls and, and clarify very burning questions which were bothering me a day, two, or, you know, until next week. Um, they were accessing a bot, asking the questions, get tailored feedback and information would be wonderful. Tailor medicine, I mentioned already, home nursing, bringing you know, people to the home where the suffering of finding just parking spots and traveling and research sites are far away. Um, and I'm very, you know, uh, 
in a very good position because I can travel and I'm still, you know, mobile and young and prestige uh, in, in a way that not everyone has. You know, some, many patients, they're just really so much involved in their disease management. They are not able to go the extra mile for going to a research center and uh, join a clinical trial. And in addition, if it's not really something which makes a huge difference to your treatment plan, why should you add this burden to sit another hour and have all these uh, treatments going and assessments? And many of the assessments we can do more decentralized or virtual utilizing technology. So for me, this is not either or. Of course, some things we cannot do and many, you know, some treatments, etc., cetera, um, need to be at the center. but this is the worst industry for convenience, but managing a disease, any kind of convenience which I could get, I would love to have rather than give all the burden to the patient. And this is still relevant and, and true today. So if we change that, we can include and expand on uh, diversity as well. I think that's such an important perspective and, and our audience may not know, but, but you, lived in the world of clinical operations um, for a long part of your career and so are very used to dealing with the hospital setting um, and yet as a patient that overwhelming experience that you had all of um, all of your work life um, didn't help at all with how overwhelming that experience was so um, really good points for all of us um, to keep in mind as innovators in the clinical trial space all righty, let's spin the wheel. Jeff, you're up next. You ready? Deal. Um, Jeff was telling us before we got online about how he loves um, to, um, what did you say? Change the status quo, I think. So yeah. you're, a, you're an innovator. Um, and in the world of, of um, clinical trials, there are a there are large cohorts of clinical investigators for whom this is their job. This is their livelihood to do it the way that it was has always been done. Um, so as an investigator, we may be talking about decentralized trials as something that's very logical. But for investigators, this is quite revolutionary, like really she does change the status quo. So tell us about that perspective. Um, what are the challenges as an investigator around decentralized trials? Yeah, Michelle, that's that's brilliant. And there are loads of challenges around the investigator. Um, boy, where to start? Um, Yvonne was just talking about her experience of, of having a doctor's appointment and, and going and then sitting there and waiting. That we, we've, we've all had that experience, right? The entire healthcare system is designed around the doctor's schedule not around the patient's schedule. And the doctor is most efficient if there's a backlog of patients waiting so that the turn of the rooms is fastest. It's focused on the doctor's schedule, not the patient, not patient satisfaction, not the patient experience. Um, so that's a, a barrier, right? Because you have investigators that grew up in that world. They grew up in a world where the scheduling is around me. And decentralized, the scheduling is around a mutually agreed time point where we're going to be online through telehealth, through some platform, and we need to be at that moment available and capable of doing this. It's not, you know, now the patient and your coordinator, and they're all sitting online waiting, and the doctor's like, you know, I'm not going to be ready for another 30 minutes. That's not acceptable in a decentralized um, uh, mode of transaction. So that's a barrier to investigator adoption of decentralized. The economics is something that I've discussed for years. We mentioned very early on in this call, the different types of decentralized. There's 100% decentralized. All of the data acquisition is, is, is where the patient is, whether it's their workplace or their home. There's hybrid where it's a little bit of back and forth. And frankly, a lot of the research we do today, we don't really call it decentralized, but a lot of data acquisition is actually collected from the patient's home anyway. We just don't give it the nomenclature of decentralized. The issue economically with, again, investigator adoption of decentralized, 
when sites are creating a, a contract and budget with with industry, we're paid to draw the blood and interpret the labs. We're paid to do the EKGs and interpret the EKG. We're paid to do the physical exam and interpret its results. In a decentralized model, the revenue per patient per visit goes down for the investigator, for the investigative site. And so revenue would go down and staffing would remain the same because you're still doing regulatory and contract and budget. You still need a coordinator. You're still doing data entry. So therefore your profit goes down. The hybrid model is the most worrisome for me because it's the model the industry tends to love because they get to dip their toe in the water. Hybrid, little bit of decentralized, a little bit of not. But in the hybrid model, if you've got this phenomenal investigator who's saying, I want to try decentralized and it's hybrid, they're getting less revenue per patient per visit. And yet the geography is still limited by the distance a patient is willing to travel because the protocol was designed where the patients have to come to a physical brick and mortar site for some of the visits. And so therefore you're enrolling the same number of patients you would have if the entire trial was at your office you're not getting the benefit of enrolling the entire state or the entire province or country, wherever you might be in the world. And so in fact, your revenue goes down, your profit goes down. That's a risk where the best investigators, the ones that are really devoting their careers to research, the best investigators go, this isn't in my best interest. I'm doing all of this work. And in fact, I make less it's, it's not worth my time. I need to focus my time and attention over here. Huge risk for us. And so I'm very passionate about, we need to design decentralized in a way that it works for all parties involved because I believe in decentralized, as I said earlier, it's in the best interest of the patients and our industry. Economically, we have to design it so that we get the best investigators involved. And then the third point I would make would be around technology as a barrier to entry for investigators. There are some great investigators who are maybe not the most tech savvy. And our industry in and of itself, technology is ubiquitous today. And on every research protocol you have, there's so many vendors involved and everyone wants to use their own platform. And so you have 12 usernames and passwords for all the different platforms we're using on a research trial. It's only that much more in decentralized. And so mm -hmm. it's something we have to recognize as a barrier to entry. If we want the best of the best to be involved, we have to remove every barrier to entry that we possibly can. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jeff. I think it's a real great dose of reality. Um, we like to think of these types of hybrid or decentralized trials as the sexy thing that, um, sorry for that, but um, they're the new shiny toy. Um, yeah. And um, with, of course, an important patient benefit. So it makes all the sense to us with our fancy technology um, in pharma, biotech, or, or technology companies. But we have to remember that um, in large part, doctor's offices still exchange information via fax. So um, getting them comfortable with um, patients wearing um, digital tools is, um, let alone the fact that that um, I remember when I was a dietitian and a member of a clinical trial site um, community, they're a, they're a team and, and their incomes depend on participating in these clinical trials, right? You wanna keep your teammates and, and you wanna keep your, your business going. So, so this is fairly revolutionary in terms of what it means to the clinical trial ecosystem. I, I just think we shouldn't forget that, that. There's both a human, but a, an infrastructure um, um, element to kind of what we're, we're talking about changing even if it means it's better for the patients, it's a pretty significant mountain that we have to climb. Agreed. Mm -hmm. um, Yvonne, no, I'm going to Elizabeth again. So I'm spinning the dial there. Elizabeth, um, so you ready? You got, got yourself off mute here. Um, so I know that, that you're in the midst of running a decentralized trial. I know that you've been meeting with, with regulators. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, the hybrid elements of that trial. Again, we're not going to talk about products. We're not going to talk about the trial itself. But, but um, 
tell us a little bit about some elements that others might be able to, to steal with pride around that trial. And if you could, um, in the second part of your answer, talk a little bit about the response that you've been getting from the regulatory community. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, happy to share some of that experience. So since spring of 2019, um, we were working on a fully decentralized trial in a rare cancer setting in oncology. Um, so we were already thinking about this type of approach before the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. And, and I'll share with you why. Um, as many of you know, conducting traditional trials in rare diseases or rare cancer settings can be very challenging due to the difficulty in identifying and recruiting patients due to the rarity, the unpredictability of where those patients are located, both geographically and also the type of hospital speciality that's around. And so trying to obtain or tap into that patient group can actually take um, quite a few years. And so we need to think differently when we're actually conducting trials in these rare settings. And a decentralized model, in fact, is attractive because it does allow for more efficient recruitment, particularly in these rare populations, because you're essentially taking the trial to the patient and it's therefore removing any geographical constraints from the clinical trial and catchment area, which, as you talked about, increases patient diversity, but in turn improves patient engagement and retention. Now, in terms of uh, our interactions uh, with the regulators, um, I mean, it is clear and everybody knows that th that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the interest in decentralized trials. Um, and definitely when we have gone and talked about our prospectively designed trial in this particular setting, the response from regulators was overwhelmingly positive. And I think one thing to note and one thing that I want to share here is, is that when we've gone and talked about this, the interest has been so high. And we have to remember, though, that nobody's really an expert here. Um, it's really about shared learning and co-creation. And that's been one of the unique um, aspects that we've experienced in our own journey. And we heard very nicely from Jeff with regard to, um, you know, the the position of investigators. And I think, again, co-creation is key. You know, we need to co-create with the entire healthcare ecosystem. And regulators, for sure, are very willing to remove any barriers that, that there could be in terms of implementing these trials, obviously considering local laws and regulations. But we also need to co-create with physicians at the sites. We also need to co-create with the participants. We need to really bring everybody involved on this co-creation journey as we're learning together. And I think as in industry, we can have a really play a big role, not only shaping the thinking with regulators that can impact in guidances, but also bringing that much needed clarity to investigators and participants as well as we kind of move forward to this type of trial approach. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and uh, really important, I think, note that we're all learning there aren't experts um but there are people like craig who've been doing this um for a while so um and craig i love your fancy microphone that you've got there you must do um, quite a few podcasts um, but do you have yourself off mute um so the the next one um comes to you so so we're talking about things that we all need to be aware of because while it's logical, it, it is also new for, for many people and there's some learnings and experiences. But from, from your perspective, um, um, working across the, the ecosystem, um, where are we right now? Like, like if, if you had to like place a bet on something that would, would tip the field, um, uh, what is that? Um, what are some key things that you're looking to influence in your work? Michelle, as the uh, uh, with my um, my office mates being two very yappy dogs, I had to invest in a uh, in a microphone to try to ah. block them out as best as I could. Got it. But, uh, I think the uh, the adoption signals we're seeing across different stakeholders are are really meaningful. Sponsors have indicated that whereas only about twenty percent were um, uh, had initiatives driving the adoption of decentralized trials prior to the pandemic. That's upwards of 87% of sponsors right now. 
doesn't mean everything is flawless in terms of internal support and operations right now, but it means that more and more large pharma have looked at their portfolio needs. They've identified partners. They're modifying their training. They've reviewed their SOPs to see where there are collisions with maybe a language written in the past, even looking uh, at protocol template language. And in some cases have now processes that help those study teams to make informed decisions on what decentralized methods are right for which studies. I think that it's still early days though, and what those support models look like for study teams is still emerging. As Jeff mentioned, um, investigator sites are still grappling with many of the challenges around um, what study budgets need to look like with sponsors for these models going forward. But support among investigators is really meaningful. WCG has surveyed investigators on the use of telemedicine in clinical research. Those numbers have gone from uh, roughly a third of investigators, a quarter of investigators prior to the pandemic using telemedicine in research, now three quarters saying they plan to continue to use telemedicine in research after the pandemic. And obviously, as we keep pointing to participants, and when we look at survey data from participants, only around 9% say that their preferences for all visits to be at a research site, uh, but they're not all coming back saying that they want it all to be from home and online. The, the majority, some 58, 60%, uh, prefer this hybrid future, having more choice and flexibility. And that makes sense. The ratings of the experience of participants at research sites is overwhelmingly positive. The challenge in our ecosystem isn't that patients don't like investigators and uh, don't like going to sites. The problem is they can't always get there. It's a question of access and providing more choice as we keep pointing to. I think it's also important to note, as was just noted a moment ago, that regulatory feedback during the pandemic has been very clear and supportive. But for some operators, there are concerns that, well, only a handful of regulators have been really forthright and progressive that after the pandemic, they'll continue to support these methods. We've seen clear statements from the US, from uh, Denmark, from Sweden. And it's not that other regulatory authorities have indicated that they're pulling back on their receptivity. It's just that there's ambiguity. There's not that type of clarity that study teams really want and need to feel confident moving, moving forward. Um, so I think that our trends are certainly leaning very positive when we look at regulators in general, sponsors, sites, participants. There are still plenty of challenges we have to address around regulatory ambiguity and some of our investments in modernizing our endpoints, our digitization of measurements. You mentioned using different wearables and sensors, but that takes planning and investment for study teams to have a new endpoint that they can rely on and that regulators and others can base decisions from. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, it's, it, you've got me thinking about the pandemic and the pandemic was a situation where, a, a, um, you know, the virus came at us and within a couple of days or a couple of weeks, our world changed. Uh, and, and in some ways, then it tipped us into this, this future of telemedicine where there might have been resistance before. Now there's like wholesale acceptance of it. Um, Jeff, in this, like, how how do we get? I don't want to experience a pandemic again. Believe me, but 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 how how do we get something that just makes a new norm, like the new norm, without all of the pain? Is is there are there any innovative technologies that are out there that 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 we all could work together to just accelerate and make it so? Or, or is this really going to be a long journey of adoption? And 20 years from now, we're still going to be talking about the value of decentralized trials and the promise. There's, there's no magic wand. I, I wish there was, but, but that's a, a fantasy. Um, the reason there are so many change management conferences around the world, and there are people that get their certifications in change management, is because change management is not easy. If it was easy, no one would need a certification in it. 
Um, the same is, is true here. There's nothing that's going to make this process easy or magical or, or rapidly create adoption. But it's been happening for 28, 29 years now. We started this road toward direct-to-patient research three decades ago, and, and it continues. So it's not as if we're at the starting line. We're three quarters of the way through this marathon, and we'll get there. My focus is on, as I said earlier, um, removing all the barriers to entry. The more we can grease the wheels, the more we can make it so that it's the past path of least resistance, the greater the adoption. From a patient standpoint, an investigator standpoint, you mentioned already the regulatory bodies are already on board. Industry is beginning to say, we get it. We understand this is in the best interest of everyone involved. But when it really comes to putting budgetary dollars behind something that may look risky, many times industry will pull back on going with a decentralized route. The more we can make it the path of least resistance, the greater the adoption and the faster we'll get to the finish line. And I don't think I don't think we'll ever be in a world where everything would be called DCT. There'll always be a little bit of both, but there's going to be a shifting. And in my opinion, the majority of research 10 years from now should be DCT, not brick and mortar. So we're going to come back 10 years from now. So mark mark your calendars <laughs> in, the, in uh, the year 2032, I think, right? And uh, let's see where where the world is at. Um, Yvonne, over, over to you now for the... Um, I'm really curious to double click for a minute on this patient perspective. Uh, and of course, we're talking about the clinical trial ecosystem. So um, just as you said, um, uh, when you were diagnosed, you're, you go from being a healthy person to a person with a condition needing treatment and you want treatment fast. Um, with regard to decentralized trials, like at that moment, um, what are some things that, that sponsors of trials could do, that patient communities could do to, to make it so that, that any trial, but decentralized trials would, would possibly come into the sphere of what patients are looking for when they're, when they're at that moment of wanting to plug into the, the treatment setting? I think we should utilize more technology to make visible which clinical trials are running. Patients still don't know very well which clinical trials and which indications are running. I mean, we all know where to go, but patient groups are pretty often lost. I get this question very often because I work in this area. Do you know where this clinical trial is running for such an indication and so on? So increase visibility and accessibility of clinical trials and then make it easier to be part of that. It's very difficult not only to find, but then to enroll. We, we think, okay, you go to your doctor and you just ask to participate and everything meets the criteria and then you, you join. But that's not how it works and, and we all know that. But we don't use technology to provide this information and make it accessible for patients. I mean, there are areas in this world, like China is a good example, where my uh, in Pingeng, the company, Good Doctor is the application. So it's a whole the healthcare system is going more virtual or decentralized and providing telemedicine explanations and access to clinical trials, which means you bring all the services to the patients where they live, in rural area or wherever. Um, the patients are everywhere. They are not just one, two big sites, which we usually target for enrolling um, into a clinical trials. And then make it easier. It's just too hard to go to clinical trial centers um, for wherever you live. So transportation services, home health, which we already mentioned, increased visibility. I think we need to rethink about how we target patient, direct to patient advertisement, as we call it. Um, and in Europe, we don't do that. But there are mechanisms how you can do that. And we, we still consider data protection more seriously um, as important than increasing 
patient's experience and wellness overall because the managing the disease is hard enough and then on top to in, in be included in a clinical trial um, also education and awareness i mean right now many patients still think clinical trials is a money making machine and why should I really participate? So I think there's an element on education, which in a decentralized trial, you have everything at the fingertip at one place to go. And I hope that's not always the case, Jeff, to have 15 different login accounts. I mean, that's from the industry perspective. There's a, it's a big jungle and many um, the so solutions are out there, but we need to come into this Amazon type of solution, a marketplace where uh, patients can log in in their clinical trial or understand, first of all, the disease and then log into a clinical trial. Even pre-screening, why not? Why cannot patients reach out directly um, to sites when they know about the trial? But the, the awareness, what is a clinical trial, how can we enroll, um, is not there. And then the yeah, convenience yeah, factor. Yvonne, yeah, just to um, ask a question about maybe like can community pharmacies, we have a, a question um, from Brett in America about yeah. is there a role for community pharmacies in, in DCT? Yes, certainly. And I think there is already a role uh, in the U.S. where community pharmacies start to be integrated in the DCT landscape or operating a model. I mean, the, the experience I just mentioned earlier, it adds to it that you get a prescription, you have to go to your pharmacy. And in Germany, it's about every three months, I have to get again a prescription. I only get a prescription when I do a phone call and I don't go through the line, etc. So it's very hard to get the drugs and the medicines uh, on a regular basis. And we, when we talk about chronic diseases, long-term treatments, <clears throat> like in my case, five years anti-hormone therapy, every three months to get a prescription to go to a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. If I would be in a clinical trial for this treatment and I get my medication uh, regularly from a pharmacy, that's one part. And I think pharmacies can also provide some services, you know, mm -hmm. some medical services. We have seen this with COVID to do the testings and become a healthcare service um, as well. So there's, I think, a lot of opportunities, not only in the US, I hope also in the rest of the world. And that's where COVID was an accelerator for us to accept those mechanisms. And my belief is only because suddenly many more people became patients and were affected and we had to find ways how to to manage that and provide better solutions. Yeah, that, that's super. I'm, I'm looking at the questions now. Um, the chat wasn't visible to me previously, so I just figured out how to look at that. So now I'm seeing the audience questions here. Um, so a question for Jeff and Craig, and we might need to do some um, rapid fire here. Do you think that medical IT and data security infrastructure is actually available to implement these a significant level of DCTs, um, even in the so-called developed countries? Is there such, do we still have infrastructure deficiencies? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that one? You know, when you when you look at a lot of developed countries, many of them have skipped uh, developing countries. Many have skipped past our uh, legacy landline based approaches for telecommunications and uh, and really focused on a lot of use of wireless. Now, there may be some bandwidth constraints that need to be need to be considered when we're deploying technologies. We can't assume that people have access to devices. We can't assume that they have the bandwidth at all times. We need to support people so that we have equitable access and we're not creating or exacerbating a digital divide. But I think that the security protocols are, are pretty well established at this point for us to be able to manage data flow with integrity and security wrapped around it. Um, that may mean we're provisioning devices in many cases rather than always enabling you to wear the watch that's already on your wrist. But we're getting better and better at that, even in enabling that bring your own device future. I'll be a little more pessimistic than Craig. Um, I, I think the infrastructure is largely there and I'm willing to bet there's not a single person on this panel who hasn't been dropped from a meeting because their internet went out and we're in developed areas. So let's not be unrealistic about the fact that patients are going to experience the same thing. They're going to be in the middle of a doctor's visit and they're going to get dropped or the doctor's going to get dropped. It's going to happen. That's okay. doesn't mean we don't go down that path anyway. 
Um, I think the infrastructure is, well, I mean, it's, it's clear. The infrastructure is better than it was last year and better than it was five years ago and better than it was 10 years ago. And Craig's point is exactly right. Many developing companies, uh, countries, <laughs> developing countries are leapfrogging where the developed world was 10 years ago, right? They're not going, they never, they never had landline phones. They just went straight to cell phones. And, and the same will be true in a lot of other areas. I have issues with the quality of the technology that we're using. The infrastructure, I think, is evolving sometimes better than the quality of the technology. So I have lots of trials going on with, with e-consent, and the e-consent doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We have to go to paper. We have an e-consent product. It doesn't work. We've got e-consent products that a new amendment comes out, and the e-consent product doesn't register the new amendment, and so we can't use it. Um, there's e-consent products that allow the patient to sign as if they were the investigator. So there's a lot of issue with the quality of the technology as well. And that's a barrier to success in DCT. And um, thanks for that. So, so we shouldn't be naive. This is, um, while there's been progress on things like data security, it's, it's still that, that huge mountain to climb in terms of maturation of the overall ecosystem to support um, this DCT approach. Um, Elizabeth, um, you know, when you run clinical trials, you have to go through ethics committees. Have, have um, ethics committees presented barriers in your experience? No, no. So actually, we've uh, met with quite a few ethics committees together with the regulatory authorities. And in fact, I mean, we we've openly talked about the hurdles and what those hurdles are but in fact the ethics committees were really open to help overcome those hurdles so we have not experienced really any specific hurdles from the ethics committee they're very much on this solution orientated approach that's that's great that's that was for nilio in in portugal so um any direct experience with portuguese uh, ethics committees by any chance not directly with portugal but we've been to Spain, um, but not directly with Portugal. Okay, great. Um, and then um, a question from from Angela in in the UK. Um, what what would be the realistic limitations of decentralized trials, and and how might they be overcome? And I'll I'll pose this one to to Jeff. Maybe we we covered this a bit in the previous answer, but is, if there's anything else you wanted to add. Sure. Um, realistic limitation to DCT. We're not going to do cardiothoracic surgery in somebody's living room. No. So there are realistic limitations, right? Dosing, uh, we, we've talked about breast cancer, dosing chemotherapeutics in somebody's living room. There are, there are obvious um, therapeutic areas or certain trial designs that require the patient to be under a, a higher level of care. That's that's really it. That's the realistic barrier to what we can push into the patient's home. In my opinion, anything we can push to the patient, we should push to the patient. And the only barriers are where the risk to the patient are such that we should keep that in a hospital setting or a physician's office. Michelle, I think we also have to keep in mind our original definition for decentralized. The home is one location. The goal is improving access. Um, when we look at the ASCO task force here in the U.S. For, that's looking at decentralization of trials, it's not just about the home. It's what can be done in community oncologist practices or other locations that are close to home. And that's really our desired end state. Home is one location, but we got to think expansive. People for years used to say to me, Craig, what are we going to truck our MRIs and CTs to the patient's house? Obviously, no, although miniaturization of some imaging <laughs> is pretty remarkable, but the goal should be, how do we minimize the burden on the participant? Can they get that image acquired local to them and rely on a yep. central review and a well-standardized image acquisition? Great. Um, and now from, from Hardik in, in India, um, we know that the US FDA is changing their perspective um, and in some cases even approving studies um, that included decentralized trials, um, but there's still challenges around site and patient adoption. Um, and so how, what are some things that could happen that would change that, that perspective? And I'm opening this up, who wants to jump on this? Yeah, maybe I can start with this one, <clears throat> Michelle. So I think one of the first things is, is that um, 
yeah, for sure, FDA are really on board with with these types of uh, decentralized trial approaches. We are facing those challenges. And I think it goes back to the point I made earlier on. This is really about co-creation. Um, I think it's uh, really around ensuring who are those stakeholders you need to get on board. And so it's really about having that discussion with the investigators at the sites and really explaining from an educational standpoint why this is important. So I think many of uh, the panel touched on some of those issues, but I would really go back to the fact that this is still a highly evolving area and we still, in a one size doesn't fit all. Right, so you need to adapt. You need to consider what are the local laws and regulations, and how natural practice in. And the more that we can fit within the infrastructure of the site, the more easier it will be for the physician to also get on board. So we need to really take it case by case. Michelle, our, our embracing choice and flexibility is going to keep driving adoption. If we, when we give people patience choice in how they engage. And to Jeff's point earlier, investigators and sites more choice. Many sites are already investing in certain capabilities. Any physician's practice that saw patients over the last year has already has figured out how to use video. Most site networks and academic research sites already have figured out e-consent for themselves. The challenge is on a study by study basis, we're shoving unfamiliar tools and tech on them and asking them to switch to the ones we chose for our trials. Exactly. And so as we get better at defining minimum quality standards and supporting landscapes of interoperability, I think it's gonna make it easier for sites to say, yes, I can support this approach because you're letting me use tools that my teams are already trained on. You're just providing me tools when I have gaps in my infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. And one it's last just... sentence, if I may. Patients can be included. I always wonder why we are not capturing all the data from patient experience with the disease and decentralized healthcare or trials has an opportunity to develop much more insights through machine learning, artificial intelligence to untap really the causes and conditions for diseases and to bring cure. I think that's the next level of evolution we should aim for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it strikes me that in this conversation, we're talking a lot about the polarities of there's some things that are have ease, uh, um, like telemedicine might be more adopted now post pandemic, but then some things are just enormously challenging in this space. So, so how do we bridge those polarities as we move to mature this uh, clinical trial ecosystem? All right, we've got three minutes left. So we're going to do a lightning round. Um, Last words to each of you, if there was a major takeaway that you wanted to give the audience um, from your experience, um, one sentence each. Yvonne, you're first. What do you want to leave the audience with around decentralized trials? I'd like to get us better organized with all the great technologies that are out there, but we need to bring that together and co-create. Craig. Don't be overwhelmed by all this talk about transformation and radical new models. Incremental counts. Every incremental step that a study team can take to introduce these models moves us all collectively forward. Elizabeth. Yeah, I think it's really about why are we doing that and not losing that focus. It's really about giving options and choice. And I think we all play an important role to keep the foot on the pedal and really advance this forward, not just for a vision that it really becomes a reality finally. And Jeff. Okay, one one sentence. Huh? There's a thing called the innovation adoption curve, comma, if you're not familiar with it, look it up, comma, it pertains to this conversation just as well. And if we use the strategy of removing barriers to entry, we will help the late adopters begin to become middle adopters. Thank you. I think what I am taking away is this feels like it's the right thing to do. Uh, and we all need to invest in maturing the clinical trial ecosystem to make this just second nature that decentralized trials in, in any form um, will bring many more patients into the fold and experience the benefits of treatments um, that exist out there in the innovative space for any patient. So I do want to thank all of you for joining us today. It's a community of um, almost uh, 900 people signed up to join. So um, a, a, a warm thank you from, from the panelists to all of you for taking time out of your busy days to join us here. And um, my 
hat is uh, tipped to all of the panelists um, in gratitude for, for taking time out of your schedules to join us and share your insights and, and knowledge with the community at large. So thank you all. That's a wrap. And I wish you all a good rest of your day. Thank you.